when I was 15, after I watched Raymond, I couldn't get him out of my head, even though I can talk and speak. A lot of his mannerisms, the way he would move, some of his squawks, some of his stimming, so his hand flapping and rocking, I did that. I do that. Yeah. And I, I identified with that. Welcome back to Off the Cuff. Today, I am joined by Sarah Harvey, a.k.a. Agony Auti. Okay, you could see her on TikTok. You could see her pretty much on any major platform. It's so amazing to have you on the show today. I cannot wait to get into this episode. But first, I have to ask, how are you doing today? I'm very good, thank you. I'm good. I've been out in the freezing cold, got a cup of tea. Ready yeah, for a good yeah, chat. no. <laughs> You're, you're, you're ready to go. I mean, so you're in the UK. Yeah, I North went to, UK. I went North UK. So I went to London for the first time about seven, eight months ago. I love London. London's like super dope. Everyone was dressed like really nice and it didn't rain. So I actually really, really enjoyed it. I love London a lot. I'm going back a week before my wedding to London. So it's going to be a lot nice. of fun. Yeah, yeah, Lovely. yeah. Is that Absolutely. a bachelor? bachelor party or just a visit no bachelor just a visit uh we're gonna go a couple of days we're getting married in spain so we're gonna get we're gonna fly into london into heathrow and then we're gonna chill for like a couple of days in london and then go to barcelona and then get married in mallorca spain amazing yeah so it'll be it'll be a lot of fun so i'm gonna get like right into it you were diagnosed with autism relatively late at 26 was there ever a part in your life where you, you kind of told yourself, like, there's something definitely going on here, and I think it actually might be autism? Yes, when I was 15, which is so crazy, when you... because when I was 15, yeah, so I had no idea I was autistic. I knew I was different all my life, because people were telling me from the age of four, you're different, you act different, you don't act like a girl, you don't really act like a child, you're quite animalistic, you're weird, you're crazy. So those imprints like shadowed me my whole development and when I was 15 after I watched Raymond I couldn't get him out of my head even though I can talk and speak a lot of his mannerisms the way he would move some of his squawks some of his stimming so his hand flapping and rocking I did that I do that yeah and I I identified with that so I went away and I got loads of books out from the library on autism and I read them for two weeks and I can tell you, I didn't understand a word of what the medical oh, yeah. oh, criteria man. was describing. I'm it the same way. I'm the same way. Anytime I try to research something medically, I'm like, I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. Like I'll get, I'll get like a... Like, I'll get results back, and I don't understand how to read them to this day. Just like, oh, it was unremarkable. And I was like, wait, what does that mean? Exactly, because it's their language. That, that is exactly yeah. it, though. What does it mean? Because we're trying to access their language, and it's not accessible. So they were saying autism is an umbrella term. Autism is a spectrum. As a teenager, those words don't mean anything to me. Yeah, I don't I know. Mean, what I, Like, an umbrella term? Like, I just know what an umbrella is. I don't know what anybody else is like. What the fuck are you talking about? So they mean it's a, it's a, a wide scope, a wide yeah, spectrum yeah. of people. And I, I can grasp that now as an adult. But also, I didn't understand how I could be autistic because they were saying to be autistic, you have to have social, emotional, and communication difficulties. And as a teenager, I have no introspection. So I wasn't aware uh, that my emotions were very visibly different and right. difficult. I wasn't aware of that. I just knew I was different, but I didn't know why. Um, and so the answer was right in front of me, but it didn't connect. And when I was 27, yeah, I was diagnosed. The, the opportunity for me to be diagnosed was so close when I was 13, but the psychotherapy experience was quite a daunting one and my parents were great they didn't force me into it right. so they quickly extracted me from that and the reason I was there is because of my classical eating disorders which many autistics have they eat plain boring bland food the same oh really food again and again and again yeah not yeah. all autistics but some right, autistics right. will have that food phobia and I'm one of them and that's one of the biggest classic signs of autism. But it was just missed. Um, and it is because I'm a 
girl I've learned it, it, autism is more synonymous with men with boys um, and women were only and girls only really started to be diagnosed as autistic really around the 80s and I was only oh. born in 86 so it makes right, sense right, yeah. that my diagnosis was so late yeah yeah see I was born in 89 so we're kind of from that same school of like there was no spectrum when we were kids. I remember the special ed classroom yeah. had everything in it, but they classified like everybody as the same thing. Like we didn't really know what autism was. When you were a kid, sadly, you thought it was just they're retarded. That's what they told us as kids. And then they put everybody in a small little classroom that was like a fish tank. And then you would have quote unquote normal kids walk by and stare into the classroom. Special ed was one of the worst experiences for kids. I had kids that were on my football team that were in special ed, and they got made fun of all the time. It, it was the worst. I hate that but schools what, do that. What you're describing, though, is so important. What you're describing is segregation. Yes, 100%. So what, what's happened is a, is a process of segregation, and there's no, there, there was, especially in our era of growing up, there was very little effort for any integration to be made. And by integration, I mean not only sharing playground spaces, maybe a few class classes together, but there was no effort for integration in terms of educating the other children, the quote unquote normal oh. children, about yeah, the yeah. spectrum of disability. So then that word retard comes up as a slur. Yes. Because we're filling in a gap. Nobody um, really knew. And it, it was a gap that was enforced by the teachers and the people in positions of authority and power did now it's just that they didn't make the educational efforts or the societal efforts for integration yeah no it's they were true doing because the bare minimum at the time there used to be no place for disabled people in schools um 25 no. years ago but now it's a legal requirement but it's only been around 25 years which is kind of crazy to think about. And then also the, the other thing was, is they would always put them in like the basement. They were never, they were never around like the rest of the student body. And I'm laughing now because I think of just how fucked up it was. Like they used to literally put them down in the basement of our school and they well, used to have is... to come up. Yeah. And they, and they That's would like come the Morlock. up. And... That's like Morlocks from HG Wells. Like if you deprive yeah. anyone, you will worsen their condition. Yes, 100%. And then when we would get lunch, they would bring them up 10 minutes early before us and let them get lunch. And then if you were in special ed, you had to go downstairs. It was a complete segregation in the school. They were not integrated at all into any of our normal classes. It is. And now these these kids, yeah, you know, and like, how are these kids supposed to make friends? Well, I was really lucky because um, in the 90s, by the time I was in school, one of my very first friends, I knew I was different because I couldn't maintain friendships. I didn't know what to talk about. I, as an autistic, I thought you just share facts and you share what you're right. interested in. But that's not how neurotypicals communicate. They communicate quite widely, and it the conversation will hop from thing to thing. Whereas autistics are quite, let's talk about this autism or space or astrophysics. Yeah. So I found it very difficult to make friends. But my my first friend was actually Natalie, and she had Down syndrome. And in the nineties, to have a girl with Down syndrome in our class with an assistant, that was a new yeah it's education very progressive that was coming along that's some to grow but it, it is starting to happen that's it but i feel like my friend natalie was a fellow disabled person i mean i didn't know i was a disabled little girl i only found out in when i was 26 27 but i was drawn to two fellow disabled people or people who were minority or people who were seen as other i was always drawn to them as friends growing up right um, because unconsciously that's what I was being cast as was a slight outcast but I just I just didn't know why and and the diagnosis gave me a framework to, to then understand okay this is why they think I'm autistic yeah. it's because of the way I talk the way I can emotionally be too intense they see it as and it's taken yeah. a long time for me to get a hold of my emotions and I'm 36 now a lot of my stimming behaviors so I've always stimmed my whole life and stim means repetitive focused fixated movement or interest 
when a stim can be a fidget, it can be flapping, rocking, biting at skin, picking at skin. Neurotypical's most famous stim is smoking. Yes. Yeah, it's an oral stim. So right. And a neurotypical stim um, is weight training. Weight mm. training is a stim. It's the same bloody thing again and again and again. But they're regulated stims. And everyone needs stimulation, but autistics need stimulation a little bit more because our nervous systems are hypersensitive. And therefore, oh. our emotions and our behavior and everything else gets a bit out of whack because of that. For sure. See, like, I had a kid who was autistic in my class. And I don't know if you had these these ceilings, but remember those ceilings that looked like they just had a bunch of holes in them? They were like styrofoam. Like polystyrene. The yeah, like polystyrene. Yeah, and he used to look up at the ceiling and count them out loud. Oh, that's what I used to do. That's normal for autistics. <laughs> yeah, so he used to look up at the ceiling, and we used to hear him in the back of the room like, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. And I was just like, yo, like, Chris is going in. And you're like, yo, like, and then, like, when he would get to, like, 100, we'd be like, yeah, like, 100, like, you know, like. That was like my first experience probably with someone who was autistic and I just didn't know, you know, cause like in, when we're kids, yeah, when we're kids, we're like, you know, he's, he's got some stuff. He's a little, he's a little different, you know? See, can you but see why I'm people would call me different then for that? Because for me, it's normal. I just thought it was normal to drift off and look around the whole environment instead of yeah. people's faces, but it's not normal. I've been taught my whole life. And no, yeah. It, it's just, I don't know how to film. We're always like looking around and drifting away. It looks like we're in our own little daydream world. It really does. But what he was doing was grounding. Yeah. So he was staying present by focusing on one thing in the environment. Yeah. yeah. I remember one one day he got to 100 and we all lost our minds. We were like, yeah. Like, yo, like, it, he, he was it. like, he, yeah, he was so like pumped up. Like, we were like high fiving him and stuff. But he had an aide in the classroom as well. And that was always okay. tough, too. That was always tough, too, though. It's like, yeah, I'm integrated in the class. But, like, I got this lady sitting next to me the entire day. And, like, Not motherfuckers are looking at me weird. That's just a really tough thing to go through, like, when it's you're really humiliating. 12. Yeah, That's when you're 12 cool. years old, you know? So do oh. you do you wish you had an aide when you were in school? Or no. were you happy that, that you didn't, right? Yeah, because it's tough. Yeah, um, so when I was at school, I would sometimes often need, there was a few times where they would bring an assistant to help children who were struggling or that they, they could see were struggling a lot. So I'm glad I didn't have the aid because it would have made me stick out like a sore thumb. Um, and, and because I don't have um, learning disability, there definitely were times where I would have benefited from an aid because there were many times where I couldn't complete my work I would literally just freeze I'd freeze and I would dissociate which is a psycho it's a psychological disconnection from your environment to oh yeah you go to a, and you I was go doing to a, that from a young age yeah you go into like another like another planet almost because it's like a, none of this i you know it, that's yeah, really really, really tough bad. it's really tough when you were stimming in class though did like your other classmates like ever bring it up to you yes um i was quite lucky because there were a select few children who actually found my behavior to be intriguing ah uh, um, yeah 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 and they were curious by by it and because of that, I actually was able to make some friends, which I'm, I feel so fortunate for. Um, for sure. But they found my squawking. So I used to go, ah, like that. And I, I still do it if I see anything that's cute, like a cat or a squirrel or anything that's squishy. I see someone's arm and if it looks squishy, that for me, it, it triggers something. Yeah, yeah, I just want to yeah. squeeze their arm. It's like a sensory seek. It's really no, no, socially yeah. inappropriate, but I've had it since I was four. <laughs> no yeah so no. My, my, my brother that, has Tourette's that, syndrome ooh. so he had those too yeah. yeah oh you totally relate then yeah so this my brother this is familiar to you then when, my brother would be in the other room just go woo that's it <laughs> that's yeah, yeah. it that is oh that, yep. that makes me so happy that makes me so happy that you know it because oh for then, sure that automatically that's like a lived experience that you just get and instead of me having to explain it explain it but those they found endearing and can you see what i mean that 
but can you see how also people can be drawn to autistics to become friends with us because of our differences of course it's extremely interesting wow yeah so it yeah is. um but often so i have some harmful stims so because I, I'm not allowed to slap my hands. That's not allowed in mainstream school. And the teachers didn't know I was autistic. So if I was rocking mm. or flapping, it's Sarah, hands on seat. Sarah, stop fidgeting. And it, that discipline, that correction, constantly I had, constantly. And if I didn't comply, it's you get sent out, you get sent to the headmistress, you're a bad girl, you're naughty. So that was very deeply yeah. ingrained to suppress the movement. So I did. And the stim that I would do all day in school, in plain sight, that was socially acceptable was biting my skin and you can see my fingertips are red raw and scarred they're so ugly i hate wow. it it's 25 years worth of scarring wow so as a little girl i would chew here like this and because i'm quiet still and sat not a problem but i'm harming myself Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah so for that sure. self-harm stim is acceptable. The self-harm stim is socially acceptable, but the rocking or the humming or the hand flapping is not. And that's how autistics end up going into these more harmful behaviours because we're not allowed to do the organic natural ones. There's no space or room for it apart from yeah. in PE, physical education. Or in playground time. No, for sure. My brother used to pick his gums. He would pick out his gums from time to time. Yeah. And that was Your kind of like his, very... uh, his... his. He sounds autistic yeah, yeah. to me. He might be. He might be, to be honest. Like, there, there's there been times I've thought about it, but I've never really brought it up to him. But, like, there's, there's certain things that he would do, and I would always be like, yo, like... At first, it was, what's going on with Mike? Something going on there. And he would do like little stuff. So he'd be talking to us to be like, yeah, you know, and stretch his neck. So we used to have like conversations. I was like, yo, did anybody <laughs> else see that? Sorry. No, no, this no. This makes okay. me happy. This makes yeah. me so happy. This yeah, makes me so, so happy because autistic identity is so important. It's so important for this reason, because otherwise I end up thinking I'm crazy. I'm broken. I'm weird. I'm strange. I'm not good enough. But as soon as I hear someone else go, oh, oh. I do that too. Or my brother does that too. It's that connection and I don't feel so alone. I don't feel so weird. And actually, I now know I'm not alone. I'm actually part of a neurodivergent community. There's oh, loads yeah. of other humans who function in this way. And your For brother sure. being one of them, the, the, the tip, yeah, the neck. Yeah, so I do that tick. on stage. Yeah, when you do I that, you do that on stage too. My brother does that on our podcast. If, if you watch our podcast, the podcast I have with my brother, you'll see him. We'll be talking and he'll he'll have his ticks. It's in yeah. mine. Mine goes like this. It's like that. It's I that's, what it. that's what he Sometimes does. That's what he does. He hates it too. <laughs> that. Sometimes I do that by accident. It's like a gurn almost. And neurologically speaking, what we are both doing is unconsciously kicking yeah. like a stim and it's a stretch it's to regulate our nervous system it's to regulate those emotions that yeah. are so out of control and it's to regulate our sense of self but we often don't have control of when that's happening but it does have a neuroscientific neurological function um it just presents as a disorder so the, yeah, even the skin picking has a function the function is to calm me but it's yeah. disordered in that arms Yes, I, mean, I always used to ask them, I was like, like, what do you feel before you the tick comes? Oh, and he was like, yo, he, and he was just pressure. like, pressure. Yeah, I he's like, it's just like, my, that's what you feel. Yeah, he's like, yeah, it just it, it just has to come come out. Like, he'll do it that, you know, out. it has to my like my brain is like it. I can't go without with I have to do that. So I'm like, like, oh, breathing. Uh, yeah, it's like it breathing. is. It needs to be let go. It, it's like a bit of energy that's kind of coarse and st stuck in the body. And when you stretch, it, it, it's released. And yes. even with clicking, you can release it with like clicking, flapping, snapping oh, yeah. at the knuckles. A lot of autistics will snap at the knuckles. Well, what I've learned is that you can regulate all of this pent up energy, emotion. And instead of it coming out as clicks and ticks, I, I go to the gym now four times a week. And it's reduced a lot of my self harmy stims. It doesn't get rid of them. It never oh, really? Will get yeah, rid right, of them. right. But it reduces that 
pressure to move because I've moved so much. I've displayed uh-huh. so much energy at the gym that there's less of that energy that's coursing around me. Oh, for sure. That yeah. Cause it, that's what he would say though. Like too, it's like um, almost like excess energy too would, uh, would have him like uh tick a lot more because his ticks yeah. used to be more verbal when we were kids. Like it would be a lot of like, huh, huh, like, you know, like that in the other room. And sometimes be like he would say like full phrases. Mm. Like he had this whole time where he would just say, mm-hmm. fuck cheese. He would just go, fuck cheese. Yes. <laughs> that's what he did. That, that's what mine is. How thing. about no, Scott? How about no? <laughs> that's it. How about no, Scott? Is, is mine. How about no? And I yeah, just like yeah. to play with the no, Scott. <laughs> and he just go over it again and again. Yeah, and that's I've what he did. That what I'm doing that's it but from a neuroscientific point of view what we're doing is activating something called the polyvagus nerve and it is so important polyvagus nerve yes the polyvagus nerve it's one of our nine cranial nerves it runs from the brain all the way down the central nervous system and it regulates our heart our digestion our circulation blood pressure all of it the dorsal vagal nerve runs from the brain down the spine as a very Uh, old mm. nerve that nerve shuts us down it shuts down our digestion it Mm. creates tummy problems it makes us socially withdrawn it puts us into a freeze state and the polyvagal nerve moving gets us away from the dorsal vagal freeze state so stimming is so vital even the ones Mm. that seem bizarre all have a function even the new yeah, scott <laughs> has yeah, a function yeah. because i'm i'm activating my nasal cavity and the throat yeah you're self-regulating almost the polyvagus nerve so you're making noises you're creating vibrations and it looks weird it looks socially bizarre but it has a biological neuroscientific function and when i learned that that set me free that really set me free in my For own sure Head. yeah for sure because it stopped me from believing i'm broken it's like oh, a very long time ago <laughs> yeah yeah then, well the other thing yeah. too is like in your situation as well it's like you know you were young when you got diagnosed but it just in the in the scheme of your life you're still a young woman but it's you've been undiagnosed longer than you've been diagnosed so it's like you kind of have to like recalibrate your entire life kind of which is a lot thank you it is it is a recalibration and i tell you what when i I saw how they described us it was very difficult for me because they're 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 deficit at social they're deficit they're shit autistics are just shit did you know they're a burden to society i'm like right one second there has to be a more logical explanation behind the psychology that was only drafted in the 40s and that is constantly yeah. revised so neuroscience is where i landed because neuroscience does more than what psychotherapy could ever do and it does more than what psychiatry could ever do neuroscience gives us a window into the mind it uses mri scans and cat scans and et ct scans to look at how the electrical brain waves are activating different areas within the brain with psychiatry oh. Psychiatry only ever looked at people's behavior and they observed what was socially abnormal from that without any real science, scientific base. So I right. feel like neuroscience is going to crack open the DSCM5, the psychiatric model of autism, OCD, schizophrenia. Over the next 10 to 20 years, we are going to have some revelations that are going to tear up some of the definitions and completely redefine them. For sure. From their and finding, it, I believe. I hope, hope so. That will help also in terms of, you know, for certain medications too, like the like how it works with certain stim, uh, stimulants and stuff like that. So like I tell I tell like my brother was always afraid because when my brother took medication for his Tourette syndrome, it made him like super tired and he like wasn't like Mike. So like he would just kind of just be like, yo, what's up? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he would be ticking less and like it would be easier on him. Like he used to tell me it, it would feel like he played like a football game some days. Yeah. Because he'd be so sore from ticks. They can exhaust us because we are releasing energy. It's like, meh, 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 and it's, it, 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 
it can be exhausting for us. Yeah, it can yeah. be the last. And then, like for him, it was it was tough. But at one point, he was like, "Listen, he's like, if I got to deal with these ticks, he's like, I'd rather like be like myself and and deal with these ticks than like I don't want to be like all like drug drugged out." You know, he's like, that's just not for me. Like, it just takes away too much of who I am. So he's like, this is just who I am, bro. Like, I have these tics. I deal with them the way I deal with them. And, you know, everybody, I always say it's different strokes for different folks. But the more you know about the actual science, I think the more it will put your brain at ease. Yeah, because otherwise you're just, you're relying on cultural interpretations of autism. And cultural interpretations are in the weird, crazy retard camp instead of the oh, they're functioning differently because they prioritize and sort information differently in the brain. And we can literally see it in this scan. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's it's the thing, just too. Lo- it's a logical transference. It's, that's what it is, too. And then also, it's like there's two, there, like the only spectrum like people know about like autism that like don't really, you know, know about it the way that people should. It's like you said, they get put in like uh, uh, the, the retardation category over here. Or they could do every math problem and like play a piano backwards. They're like the genius trope. Yeah, the genius. Yeah, trope, so that's yeah. like that's all it is. There's like you know people they don't understand that there's you know obviously the spectrum, but like there's the a, there's a middle, and then there's like a little more. I look at it like a gas tank, right? So it's like if you're like over here and you're gonna be thinking this one extreme and then this one extreme, you got to think of it. It's it's like a gauge. So like some people are just in their own actual league when it comes to what they're dealing with it, it can it. be very it can be very different than anybody else on the world it's like autism is almost like fingerprints like there's some yeah. similarities but it's everyone's like kind of different absolutely that is that is an amazing analogy it really yeah. is and, and, and a good way i would take that further your analogy and say that every brain is like a fingerprint every each fingerprint is unique However, we know it's a finger. We know it's a thumb. Yeah, we all know They're it's identifiable a fingerprint. Yeah. the way that the shell is a human. But each fingerprint, its curves and its definition is different. And the brain will hear a sound and no one will interpret that one sound the same. No. Yeah? It, even though it's the same sound. We'll always, some will not like the sound. Some will love the sound. It has different responses to different people. So you're totally... Yeah, I really like that analogy. Yeah, you could have it's it. A good you way could, to look at it. Yeah, you could have it. You could have it. Yeah, no, you got it. Thank you. So <laughs> I want to get uh, into talking about your son. Frankie. So I want to talk about Frankie because Uncle Berta. as a parent who is autistic, right? When your son was born, was that something that yeah. you were not necessarily feeling guilty, but like I, I'm bipolar. I, I, I have bipolar type two. And like depression runs in my family. So like whenever my fiance gets pregnant, I'm going to have those feelings, right? Like Like, those feelings of, you know, like, oh, like, oh man, like this kid's like, this is going to be my fault. And then, you know, I'm going to be like this. And now this kid's going to do it. Like I'm more equipped, you know, like I'll be more equipped. Like, I don't know if they'll be as tough as me when it comes to like the certain situations. So like, I'm sure, were you thinking that while you were pregnant? Okay. So with, with my son, I was actually diagnosed after he was. So what happened was, yeah. And then, and then the guilt. Oh, wow. So it went, it went backwards. First year, Yeah. Yes. And it came heavy. Because the first year, it was like, oh, my God, he's autistic. How can this be? How has this happened? Rah, 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 rah. When they were assessing him, the assessors would look at me. Yeah, they're like, what the fuck are you doing over there? Very <laughs> similar. And <laughs> it wasn't their place to say it. So they would gently suggest and gently nudge. And it was when I was in my own counselling that my therapist was like, Sarah, please don't take this the wrong way, but have you heard about autism? I was like, yeah, my son's autistic. And she's like, have you considered that you may be? And it took a year to be diagnosed. It took me another year on top of that to accept that diagnosis, for me to really let it in. For a while, I was like, this can't be real. This can't be true. This can't be happening. How can you think that I'm autistic? Like, I don't understand. And then it it was because I was in such denial like I knew I had oh, psychiatric sure. problems. I just was like, what, what? 
and then it was also like once I settled with that I'm autistic it was like so my son's struggling because of me so yeah. my son's autistic because I am what and that's when that guilt came into it and one thing I will say with yourself and it's very difficult but when that guilt arises about oh I've passed on a problem or I've made my child ill or anything like that it, it's difficult for me to say this but it isn't totally true yes they're autistic because they are, they they have your genes right that's their ancestry now but you didn't purposely make their life difficult you didn't create the ideologies that exist around functioning bodies being better than those who aren't we're in this landscape together but we didn't set the precedent that disabled people are less the people and our ancestors before us did. And that's the mm. battle that we face is a very ideological, ideological battle for respect, welfare and protections. And that's the fight I choose to take. So anytime I feel guilty, I feel bad. I put it into the work I do, which is trying to campaign for better education, special educational needs, school, more funding, um, access, training, all of that. Otherwise, I don't know where to put that pain. Because right. I put it on me, I put it on me so much, it made me ill, it made me suicidal, it made me believe I wasn't a good mother. So that pain has to be fed outwards. You cannot carry all of that, it will drive you mad, because you didn't cause the suffering that your child's going through. Right, so that's like, you know, yeah. it's... You know, I'm about to get married, and then obviously you get married, and then you have kids, you know, if you're going to go that, you know, uh, stereotypical road, you know what I mean? So, like, that's yeah. one thing, like, I worry about. I'm like, damn, dude. I'm like, it's going to be so awesome. But, like, the moment, like, I, I see, like, my kid, like, feel sad, I'm going to be like, or, like, come home and say he's depressed. Like, I know for a second I'm going to be like, this is my fault. Like, this is, like, my just fucking putrid genes. You know, like, I'm just going to have, like, that moment in my head. Like, I know I'm going to have it. Absolutely. And I've been there with that. But it's another way to look at it is that actually – if your child does have a, the same neurological disposition as you, you are the best person equipped to help your child navigate this world because you also know what that outlook is like. You've also been that child that came home from school depressed and sad and lost. Yeah. You are the best person placed for this. So hold on to that when you you become a dad. I will. I will. I'm ready to be a dad right now. Like, I'm so ready to, like, just, like, ha have a kid. You know what I mean? So for you, though, in your situation, it's like, you know, how you said, like, I would be the best person. Do you feel that way? Now I do, yeah. Now, now you do. I but do. It, took, now, it, it took oh, you a little while. It took me a little while. I think by the time my son was two, no, to be honest, the day he was diagnosed, I turned to my ex-husband. We're, we're, we're amicable, we're friends, but unfortunately yeah, yeah. the marriage didn't work out. But I turned to my ex-husband and I said to him, out of everyone that our son could have been with, I am grateful he's with us because I will love him more than anything, more than yes. anyone. I will do anything. But I was so like, that's the way I have to see it, is he is vulnerable. My son is classically autistic. He's considered to be severely autistic. Right. Um, and, and with speech difficulties and emotional behavior difficulties are quite complex, but I believe they will calm down over time. The more oh, for sure. and skills and life experience that he, he gathers. But now I do believe, yeah, I'm the, I'm the best person for this, not just because I'm his mom, not just because I've gone through this before, but because I'm still willing to learn. I'm willing right. to learn new things and throw out old where it's wrong. I, and that's the way I have to deal with it. Well, that's what it is. You guys are, you guys are, you know, you guys are blessed to have each other. That's just what it is. Thank you. That's how Thank it works you. out. Because if you really think about it, it's like, see, this is the one thing too, though, when I have a kid, right? And if he comes yeah. home depressed and I'm depressed, I'm going to be like, hey, man, I'm depressed. You can't be depressed right now. No, no, no. It's like, hey, man, I, I need a day too to deal with my shit. That's it. You... It's, it's hard. It's hard. It really is. But to be honest, my emotional journey has meant that my son has a very strong emotional core because that's where his difficulties are. 
So I thought, right, if he's socially, emotionally, communicatively disordered, those are the areas I need to work on the most right. with him. And every day we check in and we say, how are you feeling? It's just an everyday conversation. We talk about yes. our emotions and feelings. And he gets to say, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm frustrated. And there's always space for that. And and that's what you can do. And, and your child doesn't need a happy parent all the time. Mm. You are allowed to be down and depressed and sad. And that can be an opportunity for that child to learn about those emotions and also connect with you about them. There, there is room for the, the hard emotions too. Yeah. And you going through that will enable your kids to have that conversation about everything that you, you didn't get the chance to talk about as a kid, maybe. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. no really there was the no table, chance. Really. Uh, my mom had a tough life growing up. And yeah. then my dad's parents were, you know, my, my grandfather was an immigrant who was like uh, just this hard ass Italian dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then my my other grandparents, they were like that, too, on my mom's side. And my mom, like my mom's brother died when she was a kid. Like, you know, her house burned down twice. Like she, my mom's been through some wild shit. So like my mom's like kind of gangster, like she's kind of like hardened in a sense. Yeah. But like. You know, it wasn't a lot of like discussion about like I'm sad and shit like that. That really right. wasn't allowed. You know, that's why like even like as as a man, like men have a lot of advantages in the world. I'll, I'll put it at that. But like when it came to like feeling sad and doing stuff like that, like you were a pussy. Mm. That's, that's how like people looked at it. <clears throat> but that toxic, toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause... It's like oh, it would it was always man up. Stop what are you yeah. worried about. So then it's like, no, dude, like I'm depressed. Like my parents are fighting. Like my brother's going through something. You know, I'm like, damn, dude, like, you know, I, I feel like I'm not getting adequate uh adequate attention. I'm just like, yeah, like I'm crying out for help here. And you guys are like calling me like gay and shit. You know yeah, what I mean? Like that's the... yeah, because it and that makes you more unwell ultimately over time. Yeah, and because the, they're dealing with the same shit, but they just don't want to hear it too. Because that's they're it. like, I, yeah. you know, it's that that's old saying, it. like, oh, like I have my own problems. But like, even in your situation, though, how do you feel? Like, uh, so I, I want to tell you a quick story. So I used to teach uh, kindergarten uh, kids how to swim. That was my my job. I used to teach children how to swim, and we had a kid who was one hundred percent nonverbal when he was in kindergarten, and he used to like cling to me. But, you know, we had like a couple of th like his mom came in and was like, he'll respond to this. And, you know, so I worked with him like a whole summer and like the next year he started talking a little bit more in uh, first grade, second grade. He started talking a little bit more. And by like third grade, like I couldn't get him to shut the fuck up, <laughs> you know, so, but, but when I first heard him speak when he came down to the pool, cause all the kids would walk down to the pool and he remembered me from last year and he said, hi, Danny to me. And I like, I like start crying and shit. And I was yeah, just like, yeah, yeah. I was like, what's up, man? Like, I was like, what's up, man? And I was like, oh my God. Like, like he, he's talking like it's, it's unbelievable. And then I remember by like, like the last year I was there, he was in third or fourth grade and he was just talking it up, like talking it up. It was just like a beautiful thing to see. I think as a parent, like I would talk to his mom and his dad and it's like, it's just an amazing that they trusted the process of being like, you know, like, we're just going to do what we got to do. Like, we'll go see a speech specialist. We'll figure this out. And we're, we're just going to let this go for you when it comes to school uh, for, for your son. How do you feel like if teachers, I don't want to use the word pity, but like in a sense of like how somebody will come and like try, kind of pity your son, it's like, do you feel like that's detrimental or do you think that actually helps, you know, in terms of making sure that your son gets like adequate attention in the classroom? So first of all, my son is very similar to the little boy that you described in that Frank was nonverbal. He's now 11. Let's quickly show you his face. There he is. Frankie, look at him. Frank, Frankie man. Frankie and he's now man. 11. And he can talk, but his speech is quite garbled, but he, he has a voice, he has a say. It's just not yeah. um, typical English. So the, the main thing I ask for is empathy and compassion mm. when, when dealing with these children. 
And another thing I ask for is to not throw the towel in with these kids. Do not give up on them. Because like Frank and like the boy that you described, if you give up on them, you have literally put out their opportunity for growth and development. You've mm. blocked it. And by giving up on them, I'm talking about school exclusions, expulsions, and segregation in mental health units. That's giving up oh, on yeah. these kids. But the, the, the most, I mean, pity, empathy, compassion, there is room for pity. There's, there's, there is space for acknowledging how hard these children have it, just how difficult their life is and how difficult it's going to be. There is space for that. But it's when people get lost in it, when people get lost in the, oh, it's sad he can never do this. Let's just pray for him and accept that this is how he, that's not constructive to me. I want constructive empathy and compassion, which is this lad's uh -huh. life is tough. His life is going to be hard. So let's make sure as adults, we have done the best that we can do to equip him with the tools, with yes. the experience and with the community that he needs going forward. Otherwise, pity, it's just an empty feeling. And right. sometimes I feel that, sometimes I do think that people find being around disabled children so hard because of the way it makes them feel because it makes people feel very sad to see children yeah. in wheelchairs children on breathing apparatus children with neurological disabilities it is heart rendering it is heart destroying actually to see some of these children and to really think we will never understand what they're going through but to then avoid them because mm. they make us feel uncomfortable or to try to put them out of our mind because they make us feel sad is a form of segregation that's come from pity so mm. it needs to be active compassion and a kind of a pity with what can we do you right know? yeah no it's 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 one of those things because i even you know <laughs> i'm i'm not even a parent but like when i see kid when I, I worked with kids for from the time i was 13 i was a camp counselor from like 13 to like 23 so like every summer like i was just taking care of kids you know what i mean and it was like you know i don't, don't think people understand how hard it is to be a kid sometimes yeah uh it's, no. it's very difficult and then that just being a like you know a, a kid who's you know quote unquote normal you know uh, a normal kid now it's like you know you're dealing with kids who are are trying to be expressive but they they just they don't have it yet they're just not there yet and you know my thing is i always just to be like I just wish I could switch places with them so they don't have to suffer like that. Okay. Well, that's why Running Up That Hill by Kate Bush was my favorite song. And then when they mm. had it in Stranger Things and then it went popular, that was huge. Yeah, and right. I was like, that's my song for Frank. But then when I was yeah. diagnosed, I was like, that song doesn't mean anything because we're both bloody autistic. Yeah. <laughs> And now, and now you want to know what it is? It's it's an overplayed song now, anyway. So it's like it's whatever. That's it. That's they, it. Yeah, they they they, <laughs> they 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 ruined it for everybody now too. I remember just be, people being like, "Oh yeah, like who's like Kate Bush?" I was like, "You know that song's like super old, right?" Yeah. She had better songs too, but that that's just yeah. that just goes without saying. But no, but but no, but think... that felt that that swapping that place that's sacrificial. So you're wanting to sacrifice basically and. And that that comes from an, a, a recognition that you do get it. You get oh, just yeah. how hard it's going to be, that you'd rather swap places because it's like, you know, it's just, it feels unfair. It feels unjust. Sometimes seeing what disabled children have to go through, it, it does, it, it, it feels unfair and unjust. But I really hope that having conversations like the one that we're having today it just helps people to take a step back and to remember but the humanity that does belong to these children they're not just disabled disorders something that needs to be fixed or cured yeah. they're people yeah they're humans yeah <sighs> the thing i love about kids and i hate it at the same time <laughs> is they're br they're brutally honest oh yeah and then also you know we used to have i used to have a kid with autism another kid with autism i used to work at a at a school uh, for underprivileged kids, you know, like their parents were on drugs or, you know, and they, and they had to live on campus. And we had, we had this one kid who was autistic. And every time I had a pimple, he would set, tell me I had one. 
he would always, yeah, he would always tell me I had a pimple, or he would like tell me like, like uh, I uh, used to do. You used to do that too. You, it yeah, always... I used to do that, but that's because I have it's a stim. So anytime anyone had a spot in school, and again, I was so lucky. I was so lucky that yeah. the teenagers were tolerant and okay with my weirdness. But anytime there's a spot, I'm like, you have a spot on your face. Can I pick it? So oh yeah. I'm not. I, I I don't even think about oh it's rude or it could make them feel self conscious. I don't care that they have a spot. I think they're still beautiful. But I want to pop the spot, and that's all I can think about. But yeah. then it's that social awkwardness of you don't point out people's spots, Sarah. Yeah. And I'm like, oh shit. So he, I, I used to think the kid was just like but cut I, me I up. Wanna pop yeah, exactly. Because I used to think that the kid was just making fun of me. I still want to pop it. Indeed. <laughs> no, why no he's just saying it how it is. It's yeah, I was like, damn, face. man. I was like, this kid's fucking clowning me every day, dude. I'm like washing my face like before I go to work. But then I found out they, they were like, oh, they were like, nah, there's like he's uh he's he's autistic. And I was like, are you all right? You know what? That makes like a lot more sense now. Because like if I yeah. had three, he'd be like, you have one, two. You have three pimples. Three. And I'd just be like, you motherfucker. Yeah. I was like, you got me again. And you know what yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. But that's just like how, how it was. And I remember his mom came up because they would have parents visit from time to time for holidays and stuff. And they would come up. And uh, my thing was, I always, I always felt a magnetic connection with kids that with either special needs or, you know, they need a little more extra time in the classroom and stuff like that. Because you really see that they want to learn. And they wanted yeah. to talk because I remember with the little kid uh, that we were talking about before my old camp, he used to write, he could write, you know, but like, he couldn't really speak that well. He just, I remember once he wrote, like, I, did, I, I want, I, he wrote, I want talk. So like, you know, like they know, they know, they know what's they going know what on. They, want. they know, they know what, what they want. want. They have that own internal subjective world. And oh man. They just oh, that shit broke my heart. It. Yeah, see, that was the shit that broke my heart because at the end of every every camp, yeah, they said when you come back to camp next year, what are your goals for like you know the school year, and then you come back, and his was like, I want, I want talk, and I just I had to walk um, into like the other room and like cry a little yeah. bit. I was like, damn, dude, like I'm over here complaining about like you know just regular dumb shit. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you, you realize a lot of things you take for granted. But no, the thing is, is when you see these kids come back, you know, year after year, it's a it's a triumph like you've never felt before. It's it's better than like any championship. It's better than any like, you know, it's it that was, to me was like winning the lottery when you would see kids like make these like huge strides. It's it's like the best feeling in the world. You know, I miss, I miss, I, I no, really, really do. I miss, and, and no, I miss working with kids for sure. Like when yeah, I, I get older, I would like to that. equip them. You, you know, yeah, that was the thing. That was the most fun part. You helped equip them though with that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And that, that's, you know, whatever that's helped it. like that, those kids helped me so yeah. much. I was and, like, man, like, I can't wait to see them because they were just genuinely happy to fucking see you. You know, I'm like, all these other kids are kind of all right. It. You know, well, Frank, because Frank speaks so very differently and that. he is aware he's aware he that when he opens he's aware that when he opens his mouth his words don't come out how he wants to say them and literally three weeks ago he was getting um, overloaded into a meltdown and he's 11 now so I can explain a little bit more for him about the behavior he's always had his whole life right and he's on the sofa and he's getting anxious he has OCD and he's telling me about numbers and stuff like that mm -hmm. and he said to me something and it, it broke my heart. It, he said, um, Frank doesn't speak properly, but he said it in his own way. Right. And then he said, my mind is broken. Mm. And I immediately, I've been here as a kid. I've been here as an adult believing that. And in that moment, I was able to do what never happened to me as a girl. I was able to be there for him the way I wanted to, someone to be there for me as a kid. And I was able to tell him, your mind is not broken. Remember the all system thing that mummy's been talking yes. to you about for seven years. I was like, you're autistic. Your mind is autistic. And I was like, it's because of the autism that we feel this way or speak this way. And I, I, I just redirect him to that and just right. move it away from the I'm broken. I'm the problem. It's like, no. 
you're struggling right now. Yeah. And you are different. You are different from a lot of people, Frank. And the reason is autism. And then I say, but it's okay because mummy, mummy is the autism too. <laughs> it's the that's autism. It. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, no, that's why. The... Mummy is that's the, the autism too. too. But that's the beautiful that's the beautiful that's the beautiful struggle right in in, in times it's like you know mm-hmm. my father like didn't get diagnosed with depression so like oh after all of us like went through like depressive states i've been 51 50 and i say it on the show all the time i've been locked down i've been like hey man this is it for me like mm-hmm. see you guys later you know i've dealt with all that and yeah. you know it's kind of crazy so i you've think been about a similar it. path to me then yeah yeah oh yeah you're the most equipped person to be your son's mom. I think that goes without saying. I think I think you can really understand that because you're willing to put the work in. Some parents aren't. And, and it's not Thank that you. they're bad parents. And it's not that they're bad parents. They're just not willing to put that work in because, you know, maybe they have other kids or whatever. You know, it, it, there's things that happen in life. I, now, what I want to say... I'm fortunate. No, 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 because, keep, of my, because of my autism, because of that fixate, it's special focus of interest ever since it entered our life in such an explosive way with my mm. with my kid. I've been latched onto it really for eight years, nine years now. And, and I think that's, that, that's, I know what you mean, but it's because of my geekeriness and because of the right, emotional right. unsettling feeling I get around my son's future. That's why I do this, this, this work that I do. But thank you so much. That, no, absolutely. That so, so much to me. Absolutely. I have a couple more questions, then I'll let you go. The first thing is, do you think that yeah. you you would have ever gotten diagnosed if you didn't have Frankie? I do. I think it would have taken a lot longer. Right. I think I, I do think I would have been diagnosed because of the eating disorders, the um, autistic presentation, my behaviors, meltdowns. I, I had a lot of meltdown crises in my 20s. Oh, yeah. And- into early 30s that I just didn't understand how to navigate. I didn't know what was happening to me. I didn't know it was a sensory overload or emotional overload. I didn't know how to care for it. But I would have been diagnosed eventually, I think, yeah. Dude, that's the... That's what I always like. Well, I'm uh, so thankful for my son. That's what I'm saying. It's like at least you know you got the ball rolling for you. That's it. Which, which I've is... never met anyone more like me than than my son. So I'm so grateful for him. And for all that I really am. And listen, it's a, it's a it's a beautiful thing. And I wanted to ask you too. How do you think social media is helping move and spread the word about autism? So we talk about that a lot on this show. It's like. You know, I, I I make a joke on this show. Like I was depressed before it was cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, so like I, I mess around like with that. It's like you know, how do you feel when like people will say, "Oh, I'm so, oh, I'm like so OCD." It's or yeah, like people yeah. or, or when people are like, "I think I'm like autistic." Yeah. Like you know, it's become so mainstream that people throw these words around, and I'm a big person. I'm like, well, have you been diagnosed with that? Then you probably shouldn't say it. Like I understand the joke that you're trying to say, but. No, it's just like you're anal. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's like you just like a clean house. It doesn't mean you have fucking autism, dude. That's it. I was so like, there's a bit of a diluting of the process because the information is so accessible now, yes. and because autistic people, we we are because we're people. Other people will sometimes identify with different areas of what we're talking about and our experience and our difficulties but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're autistic and they you can't know that without a whole life long psychological profile and an occupational therapist doing an assessment to help you guide guide you through that but yeah that there's an appropriation where people that i'm depressed i'm traumatized is the one i've heard a lot oh, this yeah. year i'm so traumatized what happened i dropped my app i'm like what the hell we're diluting the language here i just wish people would think before they take the term because then the term starts to lose its meaning when it comes to us trying to explain our yeah, of course. Or difficulties or needs but yeah there's a lot of appropriation with with terms like like that and it's just a bit unsettling and i hope that yeah i just hope the message isn't diluted that's the thing i get worried about um, sometimes too it's like man i didn't spend all these money on fucking doctors to get this diluted shit that i'm getting sometimes I was like, I've that's been through enough. Don't dilute my content now. It's a, uh, you and, know, and like, we're racing stigmas. Yeah, Sorry, it's a double-edged on. sword. No, it is. It's the double-edged sword. Like we're erasing stigmas, which is a beautiful thing, right? But it's like, go to a doctor, please. That's just what I say. Like, dude, go to a doctor, man. You know, because everyone that you're talking that's about, 
100%, 100% is not equipped to deal with what you're going through right now. We're just not. And that's why yeah. you see hear people like, like I, with, I, with their families, they were like, oh, I thought he was so happy. What's the first thing when somebody, when somebody sadly takes their own life? He was so, he was so happy. Yeah, he looked so happy. He was like, you know, because it's not that we're ignorant. We're just not equipped to pick up on certain signals. Because we didn't go to school for 20 years. We don't, we don't study of the brain, you know? And that's why, like, parents are like, yeah, that's like, it. that was my kid. Like, I loved him. Like, I know he was going through some stuff. But, like, everybody gets the blues when they're a kid, you know? That's what their mindset is. But they're just not equipped. It's not it's not a household thing yet, you know? And hopefully it gets there. But, you know, that's why. That's why a lot of people, you know, feel so bad. Because they were like, I thought he was fine. Yeah, definitely. You know? I mean, I think... We- with the social media, I think it brings great jobs to raise awareness and to make people aware of the condition. And I am aware that some people self-diagnose and self-diagnosis, I have some space for it because some people are denied access to diagnosis. So there's, that's like for a sure. critical infrastructure failure. But where I don't have room yes. for it is where people are seeing autistic people like myself talking about the experience giving out educational information maybe after five minutes or, or half an hour of watching us they go oh yeah okay I self-identify and it's like this is not a flippant decision it's not I'm just gonna wear this hat one day you yeah. either identify with these lifelong struggles and you, you want to seek out a diagnosis for that or you you identify with a bit of it but that doesn't mean that you can then go oh, I'm autistic it's like, like to be autistic legally and medically, you are a deficit. Yeah. You are a deficit in sensory, cognition, imagination. So when people are like, oh, yeah, I'm autistic, I don't think they're realizing the human rights fiasco that exists behind that label and then our livelihoods. So that's when it gets diluted. And I don't want to, to see autism becoming this social identity trend when actually it is a neurological disability legally still it is and, and yes yeah, so I, I do worry about that but autistic people get to have an identity where we get to be proud about ourselves we don't always sure. have to see ourselves as disabled but we cannot be taking over and speaking over the most vulnerable and I, I consider myself to be quite a privileged autistic in that I can speak and that's right. a privilege because it gives me autonomy and it protects me because I, I get to have a say Yes. Whereas there's some autistics who don't, and that's scary. And I don't see some of these self-identifying autistics doing anything actually to better the autistic causal community. And that's distressing to me. That is distressing yeah. to me. Yeah, it gets scary sometimes. That's why I tell people all the time on the show, I'm not a mental health professional, but what I will recommend is that you go see one. Absolutely. And that's another thing I, I, too, I do too is go, Just into go see one. Go into the diagnosis. But if you're identifying with this, be prepared that then yeah, not going to go. You're autistic. You're a genius. It's you're autistic legally in this land. You are neurologically less than and disabled. So that's what right. you're going in for. And then people go, okay, well, I'll have another think about that autism then because it's not. Yeah, it's like, oh wait, oh no, hold on. But yeah, no, it's not cool. We're actually for our damn right. Yeah, that's that's a thing. Yeah, like, hold on, I don't think I want any of that. Yeah, they're like, oh, like, oh, you know, like, neither do we. Yeah, <laughs> we don't yeah. want. I just like doing the dishes a lot. Like I'm yeah. not autistic anymore, you know. But the <laughs> other thing, like, yeah. One la- one of the last questions I want to ask you is, how many kids have you almost beat up with 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 Frankie what in do school? You mean? Like with with Frankie in school. How are the kids in his school? Um, so, so the Frank Frank school is special educational needs. Yeah, so, but they, um, kids Frank- are just, kids are just mean though. It doesn't even matter. It. So you know, Frank it's like school- yeah. Like, oh yeah, we're all small. special needs, but like, yeah, like, but we're just gonna be mean. We're gonna be mean to everybody. Kids are so fucking mean, dude. That's it. That's it. But he's in a class with um. His first school was like only five children in the class, and the the school that he's at, which he's really enjoying himself at, I think there's ten or twelve children in the class, so they're quite manageable. Um, having run-ins with a kid at the school at the moment, but they're quite similar in that they will defend their territory. They'll both get into the fight kind of state. Oh, they yeah. won't fight each other, but they'll get into that angry fight state and they will match each other. So with Frank, he's very good at defending himself. He's very good at speaking up for himself and saying, I don't like this, no. He's good at not 
complying and submitting. It's something that he actually can't yeah, yeah. do. <laughs> he doesn't know how to comply. Um, he knows how to oppose. So it's I've been quite fortunate in that it's not necessarily been the other children that have been an issue. It's mainly been staff in the other education setting for treating yeah. him so barbarically. There's that too. For treating yeah. him as if he wasn't a disabled child, restraining him unnecessarily and traumatizing him that's what they did in the past so it was actually heartbreakingly it was actually the adults the people in positions of authority and who my son's supposed to build up trust towards they yeah. completely traumatized him out of school setting for two years and after two years out of school he's finally back and he loves it and that's because these teachers they're all about the kids god damn they sound they like it. you when you know, you said that there's a special connection with children who are more vulnerable. They are all about the kids, and it translates in how they are with my son. Yeah, he feels th- and... it. I've been lucky, but there's been a lot of neurotypical children who. I, there's one child this year. I have to <laughs> there we go. I know. One child. I was gonna get one. I said, when we yeah. were out and about, when we were out and about, my son was on the bike track, and he was waiting to go on the bike, but uh, on the ramp. But as he's waiting, he's humming. He's going, hoo, hoo, hoo. yeah, yeah, yeah he yeah. just always makes those noises. And that's when the other kids who are the same age as my son. And that's where I can really see the difference as well. And it hurts oh. me. It hurts that there's that gap. And they start laughing at him. One of them says the R word yeah. to his friend. So I immediately just start marching oh, in a yeah, line yeah, towards yeah. the child. I wait for Frank to go on the ramp away right. from me. And once he's away, I turned to the, the child and I said to him, can you tell that he's disabled? And he went, I, I can tell he's different. I was like, yeah, but can, can you see he's, he has a disability? And he's like, I didn't know he was disabled. I was like, well, that's why you're laughing at him. You're laughing at him because of a disability. And um, you're not disabled, are you? And he went, no. And I went, right. So you actually are the ones who are supposed to protect him. You're supposed to look out for him because you can do more than him. You're supposed to be there. You're not supposed to laugh. I was like, next time you see a little boy like him, don't laugh. Think, what can we do? And he went, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't know if he was disabled. I won't do that again. It just made him think of, you know, if I see a disabled kid, actually. I, I, and what I was trying to do with that boy was let him know you have the power to be better mm. than what you're, you're being. You have the power because you actually do have the power in this situation. Because you're with a disabled person, you have more autonomy than him. So don't laugh, don't be cruel, because that sticks to my son's heart. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then also, it's like, I'm happy you let him go down the bike ramp, because you would have been like, my mom's going in right now. Oh, yes. I had to let him go first. Yeah, because you I don't like... Never like... In front of him, because that's just so embarrassing. Oh, yeah, <gasps> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I'll yeah. fuck a little kid up, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one oh. thing I'm worried about too. Like, I, but I apologize. I apologize to the of kids. Course. Like, I said to him, "I'm sorry. I talked to you. I'm sorry. I know you don't know me. I'm sorry, but I'm his mom, and I had to just explain that that's not okay." Yeah. But I did apologize. See, to that's the, the hardest thing because, but that's the thing though. It's like I feel like, and I'm saying this with no children, so I'm obviously an expert. But you know, with having no children of my own, if someone bullied my kid. It would take every ounce of me not to get on that bus the next day. It is, yeah, it's hard. I, I often get more angry about at the parent, which I know me is not too. always rational, but because I'm not, I just cannot be angry with an, a kid. Um, and if I am, it has to be very, very obviously controlled and, and courteous. Right. But at home, I'm like, how dare they? How dare they hurt him? How dare they make him? What is that? And then I get angry about the, do the parents know? And well, and yeah, yeah I've been See, in that's that a, little that place. Yeah, there's gonna be like, listen, man, I'm gonna ride this bus home, and then I'm gonna beat the shit out of your dad. Yeah, like in my head, you know. But like, I'm not a violent person, but I just can't imagine just like your kid comes home and and they tell you that somebody was fucking pushed him over, or, like did some shit like yeah. this, or you know, or made fun of him, or called him a name, or something. Like the animal instinct in me, which we that's all it. have, that's which it. we that's all fight. have. That fight response, that's what I mean by the fight response is what Frank does oh, yeah. a lot. And it's a valid response. It's a protector response. Yeah, um, we all have primal primal instincts. That's it. You know? And that's where mine would go, I have to I have to beat the shit out of this kid's dad now. 
<laughs> like I have to. I have to because I can't beat up this kid. And, and but I can't beat up his the dad. Challenge, the challenge for but that's the challenge is often is taking that fight and and, and trying to put it into other areas. That's what's yeah. kept me sane within this advocacy area is that okay, so the school restrained my son in the past, they traumatized him. I'm so angry. What can I do with that anger? And at first it was at the school to and fro, to and fro, sort out what was going on with my son. But now that anger still there, that pain still there. And what I do is I talk about it on a systemic level instead of a local mm, one. Right. To move it away from me, move it away from the personal into the general. But that anger has come from that. That fire has come from that. Inspired, and now inspired you I to want to help as many other people who are in the exact same position as me where their kids are traumatized and they're being blamed because their kids are now school avoiding. I want to help equip them to gain advocacy, to gain advice, and to know the pathways they need to take to challenge their local authority and to hold them to account. So that's me looking through the laws and trying to educate people. And that's what I'm going to be doing over 2023. But yeah, it's getting that fire and, and, and utilizing it as yeah, best as can. Which is why right, uh, anti-bullying campaign, you know, fuck it. Uh, I might have to do an anti-bullying campaign because none of these kids seem to know just how much it it hurts to attack another kid and, and, and yeah it's like it, yeah life's hard enough but you know it's, just, it's just, that's the sad thing is like i try to tell people i'm like listen man like life's always gonna be tough you know you, you got billionaires killing themselves so it's like money ain't gonna fix everything i'll tell you that right now you know like it, it's gonna be tough you just gotta be the best equipped and thankfully you know your yeah. son has somebody who's so equipped and um you know i want to thank you for the work that you do i want you to, i want to thank you for being so transparent so you. transparent with me today being transparent on your thank social you. channels for people that listen to this episode where can everybody find you on the internet okay um i'm on youtube instagram tiktok facebook and linkedin linkedin all right yeah you got them all covered i, I would have a linkedin but it would be about it would be about two <laughs> sentences long it would go work worked with kids and now he's uh he just talks to himself on a computer my linkedin would be very short that's so nice. yeah that's it but you know we're, we're making it work but uh again thank you so much and i'm gonna leave you with the last question that i give everybody on this show but before i do please say what's up to your son for me if you guys are ever in the States, I would love to meet you guys. That would be an amazing experience. I uh, want to take him to New York when he's 15. That's the age. You, <laughs> you should. You should. You should. And if I'm still here, I'll make sure you guys are taken care of over here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So my last question that I ask everybody on the show is, well, it's nighttime for you. So did you have a happy day? Were you happy today? I had moments of happiness. Yeah. Thank you nice. for asking that. That's yeah, nice yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, did. because I, it's it, it's a bland question, but it makes you think broad. It makes you really like, oh, wait, like, hold up. How did I feel today? That's why I love that question. It's so simple, but it's like not That's simple. It. Yeah, like yesterday was a very anxious day, very feeling unsure, a bit hopeless, a bit lost. You know, we all have those moments, so we just don't know if we're doing the right things and we have to just trust the process like you mentioned. But today I got back out to the gym, I went for a walk, did a bit of shopping, and it is the little things, it's the little maintenance that makes you know that you can, that you are achieving, even when it feels like you're not. It's the little steps, it's the little things, and that builds your foundation to then yeah. go on to try and achieve more. So yeah, yes. now I feel happy, I'm a lot happier today. Thank you. Good. Good. I, like I, I, again, I, I love that question because it actually causes, like, makes people check in on themselves. That's it. I don't think anyone's really even asked me that in a very long time. So yeah, I, yeah. So I, I recommend that people try to ask themselves that tr almost every day, if you remember to do it. If I was happy during this time, that was good. I got a little sad. All right. So what triggered that? You know, like where, where did it, where did that end up taking me? Why did I feel that way in that moment? You know, hey, these, I, I, I get these very... are some great reflective tools. To... You're going to be a great papa bear. Come on, you're going to be a great ah, dad. Like, it's going to be. It's going to be a lot of fun. I, ho I hope anxious, so. The fact that you're anxious about it means you're going to be a good parent because you're you're anxious about fucking up, and you will. All parents do. But the fact that you're bothered about it yes. means that you're going to be the type of person who will rectify any mistakes you make. Like, I, I you're hope, going to be wanting so. to learn along the way. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You're going to be a great papa bear. You want to know what it is? It's like, as soon as, as soon as I have a kid, I'm taking it everywhere. 
Yes. Get because them out in the world. And especially when they're disabled, get them out into the world as much as they can. That's what we do with Frank. He's been to London. He's been to Cardiff. He's been all over the UK. He goes to restaurants. Exposure therapy like, at first, is huge. It was so hard. But that's it. We get out and about into the world. And now we have a little bond. And that's everything. Even though it overloads him, he wants to see this world because he gets and he's not, and he's not afraid because he's part of. Yeah, that's that's the thing. He's not afraid, and that's and that's tough because a lot of kids are afraid. Most things, most kids are afraid to to go outside of their comfort zone, and that's why it's like for me, that, like it's thankfully like I get to work from home. I'm literally gonna have a papoose and just put the kid here, and I'm like, like we're just going everywhere. You know, like we're just gonna walk around. You're gonna meet a ton of people. It's amazing, and. Uh, yeah, I th- I think that, you know, like, that's one great thing that my parents did is they took me everywhere with them. So I was exposed to, like, Good. people. That's, like, you know, I learned how to speak to people because my parents were always, like, we're going to the store. I never got to stay home. They would take me. So I'm just, like, all right, like, now I'm talking to this dude. But you know what I mean? Like, I'm talking about the Yankees with, like, some other kid or, like, talking but- about, you know, uh, you know, talking about a bunch of stuff. But I believe exposure therapy is a huge, is, like, the best therapy that it is for everything exposure therapy yeah. is huge is huge especially with the anxious and like you said just like here and avoidant like, types that, yeah man what the angst, that the avoidant kill, types it's been it's really good yeah that shit will that like shit will kill slow you process of desensitization yeah that's why when yeah. i when i got diagnosed with panic disorder i'm like i'm going to like 11 basketball games i'm gonna go on a plane like i have to do all this shit when I'm in a really bad state, so when I'm good, I'm like, this ain't shit. That's just that's just the way I have to do it. That's it. And you built your tolerance. You built you built your window of tolerance, and you do that slowly and surely. And neuroscientifically, it's called neuroplasticity. So you're growing new neurons and new areas in the brain from the experience, from the new experience you've given it. But without that exposure, those neurons, those neural pathways, that connectivity. That would never have been been able to originate without oh, that yeah. experience, without that stimulation feeding it in. It's, so, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful I, thing. I really, and I, yeah, I think. it's a beautiful thing. And listen, I'm so proud. Of you. I'm proud of your journey. Yeah, Thank you. uh, I'm proud of your son. And I hope that you know you stay in touch. I would love to see how he's doing with school and all that stuff. So uh, again, you're welcome here anytime. Thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, hopefully in a, in a few months from now, we, we catch up and we have this conversation again. Absolutely. I would love to. And thank you so much for inviting me. It was very unexpected and I'm so grateful to have received your email. But thank you for considering this topic as something that you want to discuss. Because about for exposure sure. therapy, I feel like it's high time we expose the neurotypicals to us. So for thank sure. you for that. <laughs> sure. No, absolutely. And like I said, anytime it's like, you know, we're a mental health show, but we're also, you know, where we branch out everywhere. You know what I mean? It's not just depression and anxiety on this show. It's it, yeah. No, it's, thank it's you the so science. much for lending time towards autism and neurodivergency. I really appreciate it. I do. Absolutely. Listen, I learned a lot today too. So thank you.